This is uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Syed Hassan Ahmed. Uh, the topic is integrating named data networking in connected communities. Uh, as it says on the slide, he's an ACM distinguished speaker. Uh, he has research interests in sensor and ad hoc networks, cyber physical systems, vehicular communication, and future internet. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the named data networking is kind of thought of as a possible replacement or enhancement of the IP protocol for the internet. Uh, he's currently with JMA Wireless. And without further ado, I will stop my share and hand things over to Dr. Ahmed. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Michael Fay, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, good to see you after a while. I remember last time um, it was in-person meeting, but then yes. who knew? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was probably the last in-person meeting that many of us have been at. Right. So, right. The last IEEE in-person meeting that I've been to. Correct. Correct. All right. So without any further delay, um, I was just trying to share my screen and let me know when you guys see it. Looks good. All right, perfect. So um, thank you very much, uh, Michael and ACM uh, Orange County chapter for having me today. And um, I have been missing talking about my research topics um, that I'm investigating or have been investigating in the recent past. Um, thank you for uh, uh, giving me that opportunity. Uh, today, um, as you have already uh, described very well, uh, that uh, I will be talking about uh, one of the future internet architectures um, emerged recently and heavily been uh, investigated nowadays, or I would say from past half a decade. Uh, it's uh, named data networking. And I have uh, given this uh, architecture kind of a new roadmap towards um, uh, connected communities um, in a nutshell. So for me, what it means for a community to be connected and for many of us, what it means to have a notion of smart cities, probably you may have heard uh, these terminologies before as well. Uh, a little bit background on me. I will have a dedicated slide on my detailed um, history that where am I or how I ended up being there. Uh, but to give you um, and everybody in, in, in the webinar uh, a disclaimer that the presentation content that I'm gonna to present today um, is solely my own personal opinion and research uh, findings uh, were done before I joined GMA Wireless. Uh, right now I'm a part of product line management there and I am looking uh, after uh, different product lines, uh, especially distributed antenna system and uh, millimeter wave uh, and open RAN architectures basically. And in my previous role, I will be talking about uh, some of my career path and research summary. And then we will dive into future internet topic. And then I will connect dots with connected cars and vehicular NDN um, uh, or autonomous, uh, towards autonomous driving as well. Then we will also look into some of the research potentials uh, that we have regarding the topic of uh, applying NDN in different um, sectors of smart cities or connected communities. And um, in my last couple of slides, I will leave you guys uh, with uh, the information on uh, what type of agencies or organizations are funding these research topics. Because I'm assuming there are people uh, from academia in my audience today, and, 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 and I can understand that uh, without you know uh, proper funding, it's very tough to continue your research, right? So I will give you key pointers where to go uh, in terms of organizations to find funding for these topics. Uh, I hope this is uh, what was expected and we will take it from there. So a little bit about uh, my background. Um, I was born and raised in uh, kind of a north side of uh, uh, Pakistan. I did my bachelor's there, uh, quick forward. Um, I was doing some research in one of the top institutions back in Pakistan. It's called Comsets. 
uh, in Islamabad, capital city. And then uh, after that, I moved to South Korea, where I was very lucky, I must say, uh, to have um, a very um, uh, unique position and a scholarship uh, to continue my master's and PhD um, in computer science and engineering um, in, in one of the top universities in the country. Now, all these alternatives, I really love traveling. So I always look into the map and I see that where, you know, where should be my next conference or where should be my next meeting. Uh, I know gone are the days when we used to travel a lot. Um, I hope that those days come back after this COVID. But uh, I can say that I have been to uh, four continents where it's possible to go. Um, in my, on the right side, I have listed my roles uh, in North America. So I started my first visit to US was in Georgia Tech, uh, Atlanta. And that's where I was a visiting researcher uh, sent by Korean government, uh, basically for a summer internship sort of program. But I was uh, doing research with uh, two professors in Georgia Tech. And we did uh, publish our findings as well together. After I graduated, basically, I moved to U.S. permanently um, because of my family and, and spouse here. And uh, that's where I started my postdoc research in University of Central Florida. And then after that, I moved to um, tenure track position at Georgia Southern University. Um, it's, it's a R2 school. Um, they were starting their uh, department with the new master's program where I supported them to start that. And in fact, the first batch of, uh, or the second batch of MS students, we were evaluating those students and being the part of admission committee. It was a very, very unique experience I got. But then um, uh, I moved uh, to Southern California, uh, Orange County uh, for my industrial job. So I remember Michael saying that sometimes you have a speaker from industry, sometimes you have someone from academia. I would say not a lot of experience that I'm coming with, but I have a taste. I, uh, I have a taste of uh, postdoctoral, uh, you know, academia, and then industry. So it's a good flavor that probably I can put on the table tonight. Um, having said that, uh, in terms of my research, uh, since 2012, I, I was... Um, uh, again, lucky enough to have very good mentors in my undergrad. And I started my um, uh, research uh, in the final year of my undergraduate. So if, if we have an audience, if we have somebody who are in their final year or, or going to be in their senior year in, in you know, undergrad, this is a time if you want to take on your research, uh, this is completely possible. And then you can you know, take it as example that people have done it. And um, I have co-authored uh, three uh, books on different topics. One of them is actually one of the future internet architecture, which is content-centered networking. Um, also, there was a, uh, uh, I had a chance to be the recipient of Qualcomm Innovation Award uh, for my work in vehicular named data networks. So uh, having said that, uh, going into the topic, Smart cities notion is, is everywhere. Um, it's um, mostly it's been driven by ACM, IEEE, um, and also um, many, many governments in different part of the globe have started their initiatives as well. As you can see here, I tried to collect some of the logos uh, from different, uh, you know, uh, countries or different organizations at least. So, you have like almost from every, um, I would say, continent, uh, I have covered it, uh, some of the notions. So this is something we have been hearing a lot. But what it means to be, uh, you know, how, let's say, Irvine or, or, or um, uh, you know, Costa Mesa or Santa Ana or uh, to begin with, like how Orange City would be considered as a smart city, right? Any city how, what is the qualification? What are the benchmarks to, to call them or to uh, declare them as a smart city? So just like, uh, you know, it's a research, um, uh, you, we always can have our definitions and uh, descriptions with the theory behind it, of course. So in my case, 
this is uh, basically the picture that I made for one of our uh, publications uh, back in 2017. And believe me or not, this figure took me almost one and a half month to make it. Um, it's not because of the graphics involved in it, but because of the idea or try to summarize, you know, like picture says more than a thousand words, I would say. So this is that kind of picture. Uh, basically, when you have a whole entire city or, or community connected uh, through, through, through the internet or through, through communication, basically, that's where we call them smart cities or connected communities. Uh, if there is no connectivity between different entities, that city may not be um, uh, declared or called as a smart city. And let me tell you why. Uh, many of us are using uh, some type of smart devices in our daily life. You know, somebody would be using your um, you know, smart watches, your smartphone, uh, smart TV, or just name many things, right? You know, smart cars, I don't know, what else? Smart lights. Why do we call those all entities smart? What is the main thing or backbone of their smartness? That is their connectivity, their feature, their ability to connect. And connect to what? That is also my question. Connect to what? Connect to internet. Anything, any entity, when they're being able to talk to each other or talk to the internet, that's, their, that's where they're called as smart uh, entity or smart uh, connectivity. So if you look at this on the city level, you can have so many departments, you can have so many organizations that needs to be connected, starting from healthcare, like hospitals and first, fight or first responders or firefighters. And then you go to the transportation, you go to different buildings, you go to you know parks and ponds and even water, underwater connectivity and whatnot. I will be focusing on this transportation today, and that will include, uh, of course, uh, connected vehicles, but wanted to give you the um, idea that when you talk about, even when you talk about transportation, I have uh, applied this color theme green. So whatever is highlighted in green out of different services that smart cities can offer, whatever is highlighted in green is basically related to any type of transportation. It can be, you know, um, a subway. It can be uh, some transportation in terms of ships or logistics. It can be even air to air uh, uh, and so forth, or it can be even connected cars. And then in connected cars, you basically uh, find a sum of many things. They can be logistic vehicles at the airport or at the shipyard. They can be ambulance or first uh, responders. They can be private vehicles. They can be public transportation. So many types of transportation, I would say, in terms of connected cars. That's where I will be focusing on. Now, uh, remember when I was showing you this picture, I said anything or any entity when they're called smart, we are talking about connectivity towards internet. So let's see some of the statistics of uh, you know, the internet traffic which are actually driving force uh, towards uh, investigating new um, architectures or internet architectures. So this is the snapshot uh, shot or data by Cisco and it was clicked back in 2017. Uh, but based on this data, they predicted uh, the upcoming year. So even this data is valid uh, today as well. So what, what are they showing here? They're showing here the network traffic overview. So which part of the world is generating most of the time, like it's generating traffic out there. So you can see, especially North America here, it's, it's, it's a lot of traffic we can see. And then uh, following that data, now they're also showing attack traffic, which means like, an, you know, the, and by attack, they mean like denial of service attack. Of course, denial of service attack will be more over exactly there where we have more internet traffic or people are trying to access internet as well. 
uh, one other side of the, you know, some, uh, uh, we can say um, analysis or uh, some numbers. Uh, we are talking about uh, petabyte per month. Uh, in, you know, it's, it's a lot of data. So basically, if you look at uh, consumer internet traffic today, and then of course in 2021, it's getting more and more and more. So you're talking about uh, almost 160,000 petabyte per month. That's where the internet traffic is going. Out of that tra traffic, another way of looking at, you know, the sub-segment of that internet traffic is internet video is taking a lot of chunk. And then you have web, email, data file, and so forth. They're pretty much uh, straight line. And then you have um, online gaming, sort of a linearish linear growth, I would say, but not as exponential as internet video. And the reasons are pretty obvious because now if you look at uh, the number of applications for smartphones uh, introduced during the last decade, or I would say services through those applications during last half a decade uh, have been using a humongous amount of internet. You can go, in fact, right now, you and I, we are using uh, video, internet video services. Uh, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, what not, TikTok, all these applications, they are making uh, people go live or, or YouTube, Netflix, all these apps, right? So you have a lot of internet traffic going on in, in the name of video content. Some of the other uh, driving forces um, or in, in terms of digital uh, transformation. So uh, this is basically content delivery network and then uh, non-content delivery network, excuse me, and then content delivery network. So basically uh, the point that we are trying to make here or Cisco is trying to make here is that now the communication, today communication is all about content. And these trends starting from 16 have started increasing. And if you look at 2020, so you're talking about more than, uh, you know, 70% of the time people are sharing some sort of content on, over the internet. Uh, but remember, just for our own reminder, if I go back to this slide, when we usually teach computer networking courses and, and when we look at the different protocols or, uh, you know, all, all the, uh, like, you know, one of the question is that what, what was the killer application of internet? Uh, I wish I could have created that um, Zoom um, uh, polling question to get the audience uh, to answer that or guess that. So uh, the, 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 you know, the answer to that question would be, um, what is the killer application of internet? Answer is uh, web, uh, your, uh, you know, uh, not sorry, not web, the uh, textual email that only contains uh, uh, text, that is it, plain text. That was original, uh, one of the killer applications, I would say. But look at not today where we are and how are we using our internet. And the same way, uh, when it comes to um, traffic moving towards edge, so we are seeing that traffic, like based on the research and based on you know the Cisco routers and all, all these companies, they are trying to put you know push the traffic more towards edge. Uh, from core because of um, uh, less delays and because of, you know, the distribution of responsibilities to keep the data for. Now, uh, some of the statistics that I showed you sounds very critical and very, very technical insights, but let's go back, let's zoom out. And this slide is only just giving you the overall architecture, make it simple. Uh, what we really do when we are accessing internet today's in today's world what we really do we basically request content and receive it this is as simple as it is most of the time again most of the time uh, we are requesting content and by we it, it cannot be me all the time but my device is doing that for us uh, and and then we are receiving content 
if that is the case so quoting ven jacobson from uh, 2009's acm conference uh, it's it's a very good coincidence that i'm talking to acm chapter and it was acm connect um, conference in 2009 where ven jacobson for the first time he brought up this terminology information centric networking and he represented the third revolution in 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 telecom i'm not sure if the location was orange county for that conference i have to check that but definitely it was acm connect what it meant was uh the concept itself what it meant was that if you have information if you're looking for any content or any side of data then why don't we keep them as a center of our networking family or a networking system because right now what is happening that we are mostly depending on ip addressing and ip addressing is basically giving identification to the nodes or machines not to the content itself so when jacobson said how about we name the content and not location or device it's going to be a pull based architecture which means consumer driven communication where consumer will be simply broadcasting an interest packet and we will talk about it so i will show you what is an interest packet and what is a data packet uh so and just wait for the data packet to to arrive it's basically requesting content from the network not from a specific host just like in today's internet any node or any machine around me receiving that interest packet if they have the content or or a copy of that content in their cache and copy should be legit based on signatures we will talk uh it it can respond the, the request also uh authenticating uh content should be priority and not the connection right now we try to uh authenticate connection we try to secure connection between two devices and and then we try to uh, secure two devices by exchanging their ip addresses or so forth but we don't really check the content itself and that is a reason even in this secure um communication paradigm and in this so forth uh, you know secure uh, communication systems every day we have a lot of spam emails uh coming into our um uh, you know like the box inbox right the reason is they may have established a good secure connection but the content was something i did not ask for and still it's in my spam so we definitely need um a system with more further less delay and more security so having said that a little bit taking you further down um uh, so future internet architectures uh one i told you that you know when jacobson mentioned about icn but then after that you know uh many many um you know researchers or groups from different uh part of the globe they started investigating uh that very topic uh what what are the key pointers here we have to name content so how naming should be done well mostly it's been done as in in in, in a hierarchical manner uh and then uh how about security how 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 to Uh, you know keep the security uh, of the content so it's it's been done by signing that content by using digital signature and then routing where i have also done uh, most of my research is like longest prefix matching is one of the uh, you can say um, methods and then caching content existing knowledge and so forth some of the architectures that been uh, investigated or are currently being investigated for future internet or icn is uh, uh, content centric networking it was basically kind of a industrial initiated project coming from palo alto research center they have invested a lot in ccn uh, and uh, and then after that we had um, ndn which was originally started by professor lee jiang from uh, ucla 
uh, and, and, and her team. So they started this uh, uh, name data networking uh, along with, um, I, I remember their ACM, ICM conference uh, and, and the very first conference when Jack Gibson was a keynote as well. So um, they started sort of giving it like more of an academic touch uh, to, to the ICN architecture. And uh, net info or uh, net information or network of information, this was more or less focused by our European folks and fellows. And then Dona and Publish Subscribe were going on and off. Uh, but I would say the more uh, heavily or the most heavily investigated architectures uh, are CCN and NDN to begin with. So I've talked about two type of packets, interest and data packets. I will just give you some basics out of it that what it means to have uh, those packets. So in interest packet, you will see the name of content that you're looking for. I just use some random name here. It's about, you know, in USA, uh, Kansas City, your speed, 35 speed location or whatsoever. It's a random name. And then you have a nonce value which is nothing but a random uh, three byte inte uh, integer generated every time when you have an interest packet or new interest. And why do we need it? I will talk about it later when I will be showing you the flow diagram of it. And then you have different selector options uh, where you can, you know, when you're designing your routing protocol or when you're designing your forwarding protocol, you can use these selectors basically to use them for different, um, you know, uh, for sharing different type of information, I would say. And then uh, any device who receives this interest packet, it performs some sort of operations that I will show you in the next slide. Uh, and if, 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 if it matches uh, the name in its cache memory, as you can see in this very case, I on purpose, I have selected the same name here. So in that very case, this data packet can be sent in, in response to the interest packet received. What it contains is meta information, which will contain content type, freshness period, uh, whether it's by producer uh, it, him, uh, itself, or it's like some other intermediate node. Also signature, of course. And then you can use this meta information to um, include um, more, more, you know, like if you have a list or, you know, selected forward a list or like based on your new uh, routing protocol, you, you can use meta information uh, uh, list as well. Just like in, in case of interest packet, you were able to use selectors. And then of course the content itself, this is the third important entity, name, meta info, content itself, and then signature, of course. And this signature will be only done by the producer itself. Uh, it cannot be uh, uh, encrypted, it cannot be done by any intermediate node. So that intermediate node should not be able to modify the content. So we are trying to secure content as I, you know, sort of promised in my couple of slides uh, ago. Uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, background, uh, you may have seen this very picture a lot of times. Uh, it's hourglass, very famous hourglass of our current internet architecture that actually shows our limitations, as you can see, um, you know, at the IP packet. Uh, rest is fine, but at, when it comes to IP addressing, that's where our hourglass shrinks down. In actual, it should have been on the case, like on the right side, where your bottleneck situation could have been made for the content itself. You see here that most of the time your communication is stuck by doing uh, connectivity related issues, not the content itself. Content is nowhere, I would say. And here you have actual content being chunked out at the bottleneck situation. Uh, and this is uh, an hourglass, if and if we will have a standalone NDN architecture. Right now it's been done as an overlay, but for talking about future, that's how your internet should look like. Now, having said that, I have introduced to you two types of packets, which was interest packet and data packet. Now let me introduce you the three type of data structures where those packets are stored. 
Uh, one is PIT or uh, pending interest table. The other one is known as content store, which name is self-explanatory because you have your content stored in this cache memory. And then you have forwarding, forwarder interface base or FIB. Uh, it's basically about, uh, and it's basically storing the information of different faces or we call them interface. So basically NDN supports the idea of using multiple interfaces at the same time. So if I'm looking for a content, my laptop should be able to send out interest packet using ethernet. If it has a, you know, the SIM card or LTE, if it has a Wi-Fi, or if it has any sort of connectivity or either Bluetooth or whatsoever. It should be able to send out or spread that, uh, you can say wide broadcast, that request. But based on different rules set up at FIB or forwarder interface selection base, it can select per interest uh, packet. So for example, if it's a GPS um, sort of request and it's always being satisfied uh, and by satisfied, I mean retrieved. So that interest is always being satisfied from LTE more quicker, so it will store that information in FIB, and next time, whenever there will be an interest package related to GPS, it will first go for LTE all the time. It will not broadcast to other faces, up till and until there's a timeout from LTE. So having said that, now we know three type of data structures and two type of packets. So I will show you how do they react or how do they work together. So let's say if I'm a consumer who is about to send an interest packet, so my um, system is gonna generate that interest packet, we'll name it, we'll you know, prepare the packet, but it's gonna, okay, I, okay, I think I should be okay. I don't know why I'm seeing my controls. Um, I'll continue. So, uh, when, whenever I will be uh, generating the interest packet, before forwarding that, I will check into my nuns uh, database. If I find that value, which means uh, it is a repetitive uh, uh, interest packet, so I will avoid that, I will not forward that. I will just, uh, if, if it is found in nuns, I'm gonna just consider it as a loop, interest loop, and I will drop it. If not, I'm gonna further check into our pending interest table that I showed in the previous slide. In our pending interest table, if I find it, that will mean that I'm already waiting for, for my interest to be uh, retrieved. So I will again drop it. If not, I'll continue. Now I will continue and check my content to store. If it is there, that it means I don't really have to forward this interest packet. It was in my content to store already, so I will just receive the packet locally. That's where the local caching comes into play. And if not, if that even misses, then I'm just gonna go ahead and check into the uh, prefix match uh, in my FIB. And if there is a prefix, uh, and by prefix, I was talking about uh, the longest prefix matching uh, in, in terms of routing, if you remember in my previous slide, that's where I'm referring to. Uh, so prefix match is done and then I just finally forward my interest packet goes out of the device. It goes out of uh, into the upstream traffic. What happens uh, on the downstream traffic when you have a data packet? If I'm a node and I am in the middle of let's say consumer and um, producer, if I'm you know retrieving the data packet or overhearing the data packet, I'm gonna check if it is in my pending interest table. If it is not, I'll just drop it. It's uh, unsolicited data. I should not be dealing with it. If it is in my pending interest table, then I can just take it, but then I have to check if it is in dead nuns list, then I can delete the pit entry, uh, go to the caching policy for my CS, and based on whatever policy I apply, I can just forward that data towards the uh, downstream. Again, Every point here, nuns management, pending interest table management, CS management, FIB management, caching policy, 
believe me or not, all these terminologies and all these data structures are stand alone research topics today in NDN. So like this slide is giving you five or six directions or research topics for further investigation. Just to give you the heads up on this. Okay, so now I have given you smart cities notion in the beginning. Then we talked about internet, future internet, give you a little bit background on how it works. Let's talk about how vehicles could have been connected if there was no wireless connectivity to begin with. So I really like to, you know, have a notion of these two pictures I wanted to show. Um, vehicle and networks. It's, as you can imagine, it's very highly dynamic in terms of um, uh, the topology. And then you have like, you know, unpredict unpredictable link lifetime. It's moving very fast and sometimes even in opposite directions. Uh, still we managed as a researchers, we managed to have safety and non-safety applications. But remember that sometimes non-safety applications can require large data. Or you have always delay constraints there, uh, both with, with and without infrastructure support. So having said that, this is kind of an introduction to vehicular networks. When I'm talking about vehicular NDN, <laughs> Uh, when we started investigating these topics back in 2014, almost six years now, or in fact, more than that, uh, at that time, there were very few groups in, at the global level who were integrating NDN with vehicular network. So I was lucky to be one of the pioneering uh, folks to start writing about it. Uh, basically, the same data structures uh, CS, uh, content store, PIT, FIB, all of them were considered to be organized by each vehicle. And each vehicle was considered as a node. Uh, and, and I have shown you um, all, all the, uh, you can say, basic architecture and, and the way it works. So that was exactly the same model applied here. As you can see here, if you have a consumer, you have a producer down here, when you are generating your interest packet, it travels through multiple vehicles and then it you know, takes it back the content itself and gives it back to consumer. Now, this is a very high level picture. My research was how to mitigate interest broadcast storm. I called it interest broadcast storm because many uh, neighbor vehicles can start generating the same interest packet even though they have the mechanism to find out the nuns, but that mechanism limits them only to themselves. They don't know what others are broadcasting up till until they hear it. So, uh, I mean, these were kind of a research we did uh, in, 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 in vehicular networks, but to give you a overall uh, idea, these are some of the research topics very actively being investigated. Again, myself, we, uh, we did some of the research in routing, in naming, uh, mobility management, pit management, uh, and control overhead. This is something I have done, uh, and I'm very open to you know discuss uh, the topics and you know generate new ideas if you would like to. But these are some sort of research opportunities in vehicular uh, NDN. Also, as I promised in the beginning that I will be talking about uh, NDN and the other entities as well. So one of those entities is healthcare uh, or smart healthcare. One of the key factor of any city to be smart, you have to have a smart healthcare system. Uh, this is uh, some like one of my research paper that I have uh, recently um, completed or still I'm working on. I just wanted to show you um, some of the, you know, the, I would say teaser on that. Um, it's basically what we are doing here is that we are designing an architecture to support NDN for uh, hospitals. Uh, it's gonna be patient and uh, doctor as a key entity, but then using different interfaces. We would like to keep family updated with the, and family means patient's family. 
we want to keep we want to keep them up the, up to date but using endian architecture and the reason why because uh, it's more secure it's a pull based uh, communication model so there is very less likely that you will start receiving push notifications but also at the same time we realize that uh, sometimes doctors or caregivers they do need uh, push based notification. So we are trying to articulate the architecture and that's where we will be using push based forwarding scheme as well when it comes to uh, NDN forwarding. So it's, it's kind of a tutorial paper that I'm uh, working or we have worked recently on, but uh, you always have a healthcare NDN uh, topic on, on your table as well. Then also you have um, the Internet of Things. These are some of my uh, publication titles or uh, uh, you can say, uh, yeah, references. Uh, the reason why I put them here is to show you um, the potential of NDN in, in IoT. Uh, it can be used in a smart home uh, applications as well where you have a server connected to multiple sensors and actuators and it can be basically connected to your car to the cloud and also to your um, uh, cyber physical system uh, applications as well so and then also uh, when it comes to your software defined vehicular networks uh, this is from a, a, a IEEE communication magazine paper that's where I um, uh, introduced basically the um, architecture to support how, how naming can be done at SDN control layer when it comes to NDN uh, naming. And if we have different uh, type of interfaces for our vehicle, for example, it can be 802.11p, it can be a normal Wi-Fi, it can be 4G or whatnot. So whatever the interface you have, this is the beauty of NDN to allow you to communicate through multiple interfaces. So we, how we can work on intelligent forwarding, it's a very good read. I mean, if you are interested into NDN and you're working on you know, software defined uh, modular systems, uh, I must recommend to go through this one. Some of the contributions from our group uh, for uh, ICN NDN. We, we are actively working uh, our one of the latest paper was about uh, deep learning at the edge of uh, ICN, IoT. And then for vehicular networks, we have a lot of uh, research um, domains. Uh, I, I definitely, maybe for the next time, I will uh, uh, maybe pick one of the article and we'll present it in more detail depending on the audience that we have. I, I really didn't want to overwhelm our, uh, you know, like uh, students maybe who are not familiar with the topic, but this is kind of our contributions uh, on, on NDN or ICN, definitely. And, and now um, going towards uh, summarize, summarizing my uh, talk, uh, who, who is funding these researches and what are the NDN potentials over the next few years? I must say I have evidently shown you my publication list and that was the purpose that uh, vehicular network is something you can apply NDN, smart health, we are working on it, SDN, edge computing, mobile ad hoc networks and whatnot. So, and then cyber physical systems and underwater, everything. These are the topics that I personally have investigated by the way, all of them. Sometimes at the very low level, sometimes in a very high and deep level. So potential funders for these type of researches, uh, I have seen uh, projects being funded by NSF for sure. And to be specific, you're talking about size core programs, CNS, NETS, uh, CPS has a potential, big data. And of course, REU programs, especially if you're talking about um, uh, universities in their transition phases now. Uh, you guys are well equipped with these knowledges and terminologies, I would say. Uh, so REU programs, uh, I'm sure Chapman University uh, is uh, very seriously taking uh, 
uh, these programs. Uh, and then you have, I have seen uh, research groups funded by NASA for ICN. And uh, very recently, one of my very good colleague or counterpart, I would say senior, uh, he got a funding from Air Force, uh, ARL uh, lab as well for uh, investigating NDN for, um, you know, battlefield communication. So, and then of course you have uh, DHS, DOT, and all the, these uh, uh, NIH, NIST. I personally was in the mix of writing a proposal for NIH because of my uh, potential for NDN in the smart healthcare system. Uh, but then I moved to industry for my reasons. So, but anyway, these are some of the potential fundings. So with that, uh, I would like to open the forum for questions if you have, uh, or you can always send me an email here and uh, that will be it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, our tradition is that our first question goes to uh, the IEEE, uh, but uh, because of the current situation, we do that in the form of a poll. So I'm gonna start by asking our host to post the, the participation poll. And basically this is gonna give us a head count of how many of the attendees tonight are um, IEEE members. Uh, also, how many attendees are representing the Los Angeles ACM chapter and how many attendees represent a student ACM chapter. Um, so if uh, you could just take a second to, to fill this out. That would be great. Um, So I think you can uh, stop sharing your screen now that it's blank. Uh, so we can kind of see people again. And I will uh, take a look at some of the questions that are, oh, there is our, our poll. So we had, uh, I guess these are 76% of the response, but we had a bunch of people from IEEE and from LAACM and student members. That's great. We'll get head counts later on. Um, we had a question from Larry that uh, I inadvertently thought was posted to the wrong channel. So my apologies to Larry, but let me ask that, that question first. And the question is, how would a content-based network determine time-based information? And he gives an example. What is the latest information from Helsinki? How do you determine that what you get is not replaced by newer information? Very, very good question. Um... In my slides, if, um, if you remember uh, when I was showing you the architecture of content packet or data packet uh, to begin with, in data packet, you had a, no, you had a sub field or a second field um, right after name, and that was meta information. So in meta information, when you have content type uh, information, and then you also have a timestamp as well. So that timestamp is going to show or declare the freshness of data. So whenever there is an original producer, it's always at the discretion of producer. So original producer is going to decide that timer uh, for, for, you know, there will be a timer for that every data packet. And when that timer expires, then intermediate nodes will not forward that very data packet. They will wait for the latest one. And also the consumer itself can identify, uh, let's say if I am talking about the traffic information on 405, uh, but I want to have a very recent traffic information, just like maybe updated one minute ago. So if I receive the data packet and that is not refreshed or within not 60 seconds of time, I may not even consider it, I will discard it right away. So it all depends on my caching policies and it depends on my uh, retrieving policies that I can always define for separate applications. I hope it did answer your question somehow. Well, thank you. So, well, questions are pouring in right now. Uh, one from Ansel. Why is NDN more secure than internet architecture today? Well, uh, the thing is, um, it's, it's, um, it's, predicted and it's, it has a, a very good uh, theory uh, behind that. Uh, one is 
in our current internet architecture, we secure channels and we secure um, communication path, but we don't secure the content itself. So when we, are, we were talking about security, uh, what I meant or what we as an Indian community say is that we are trying to secure the content itself. I would rather get a legit content from some hacker rather than getting a non-legit content from a non-hacker sort of person. Why? Because my purpose is to get content. If you remember my slide, very simple slide, request your content and get the content, right? Or retrieve it. So whatever I'm requesting, as far as that content is legit, I should not care who is sending me that. So based on that theory, we call it, it's kind of more secure from, from that angle. Thank you. A uh, question from Bennett. Uh, with blockchain proponents continually seeking new problems for the technology to solve, is there a role in the content signing for immutability in this form? Um, well, I, I, I really don't have a strong background on blockchain, I must say. But uh, when it comes to um, the different cycles involved uh, uh, for content signing, it's, it's, as I said, it's completely a discretion of uh, producer itself. So content signing is tightly coupled with its original producer. Intermediate nodes will not uh, re-sign that content for, for the consumer. So probably that immutability can be uh, solved or can be handled or tackled using that feature. Okay, a uh, question from Madeline, uh, I guess about the vehicles. Are they vehicles autonomous, self-driving? You talked about the connected vehicles and the question is, are you talking about autonomous vehicles? So my job using NDN for vehicles is to ensure their safe or faster connectivity, right? They can be autonomous, they can be non-autonomous, they can be semi-autonomous. Uh, it, it completely depends on application. And, and definitely, um, you know, like people are, uh, people are coming up and different companies are coming up with uh, autonomous vehicles heavily depending on, on, on the camera, on the eye, uh, I would say. But uh, I personally believe that connectivity is also the backbone uh, of those autonomous vehicles. So these ideas or Indian research can be applied for uh, both ways. Okay. A question from Demetrius. Uh, in a pure Indian architecture, can we completely eliminate IP addresses and MAC addresses, or do we still have to keep this type of machine addressing? So uh, in, in my research, I did use MAC address as a node ID. Uh, because um, so far there is no like clear state Indian architecture. It's a mostly overlay as an overlay architecture on existing one. So currently we are using those addresses, but in a perfect world, it's, it's definitely something um, that we are trying to avoid. We, we don't want to focus our uh, communication only on uh, machines or uh, IP addresses. We want to move away from those. So I actually had a question which I'd like to interject here. Uh, is the idea that the NDN would just be a network layer protocol replacing IP or would it kind of replace multiple layers from IP down through the data link layer or? Um... Well, okay, so I don't see it happening right away all the way to data link and physical uh, layers to be, to, to be honest with you but definitely it is uh, gonna take some of, uh, um, you can say networking layer and uh, definitely application layer uh, and, and some of the Mac as well, half of the Mac that is inherited from data link anyways. So a follow-up, do you think it could interoperate with an IP network or um, is, is the idea to ultimately replace the entire internet with uh, an NDN based network layer and all that that entails? Uh, Right now, details or uh, you can say plan is to make it interoperable, which they are pretty much successful. I think they did a successful video calls uh, over the servers from UCLA all the way to some European universities and all that. 
but again it was not like pure pure it was definitely uh, interoperable with uh, with the current internet architecture so the idea is that to uh, take over some of the applications from uh, current internet to to free up some space so is it kind of like tunneling ipv6 or ipv4 over ipv6 that kind of thing or um mm, not or you say really. more of an overlay more, more of overlay yeah, because okay. IP, yeah, IP is like having a different uh, architectural requirements. Okay, uh, next question. I'll get off by the question box uh, from David, David Close. Uh, given how long it has taken for IPv6 to become common, um, how imminent would this new architecture be relevant? So IPv6 is nothing but you are basically increasing a lot of addresses, right? You, you, you couldn't handle the network with IPv4 and you're basically, you ran out of the addressing, so you started to go for IP version six. You think so that you are secure for, I don't know, um, many, many years and for the, you know, but look at the number of devices that we are using today. Um, and, and then, you know, based on the word population and all that stuff, uh, people say that IP version six can last for many years. Uh, but again, it's also the efficiency uh, is always uh, a question there too. So rather than investing heavily on IP version six and then working on integrating version four and six devices and so forth, uh, NDN as an alternative to take over many functionalities and bringing more intelligence as well. For example, as I said, um, supporting multiple interfaces in the network. That's, I don't know how IP version six can handle. Uh, definitely NDN has uh, more, you can say potential to do so. All right. Um, a question from Kay, uh, who actually does our connected vehicle newsletter, as you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, would NDNs have impact on latency? Depends what latencies are we talking about. If it is about content retrieval, uh, it can definitely have positive latencies because we are talking about distributed caching and uh, basically we are making every other node as a, you know, content distributor. So all the time your request will not be going through some nearest cache location, but right within the physical proximity, we can have a content retrieved. So definitely it can have a good impact on latency. All right, uh, from Lalit, um, what is the NDN counterpart of IP addresses? Is there any experimental NDN network? Uh, I would recommend uh, Lalit Patel that if you go to um, NDN uh, website, you can just type name data networking and it can take you to the NDN website. So UCLA uh, uh, has, a, has a very dedicated work done on that. Probably it will give you more answers. But yes, you, we have experimental NDN network. Okay. And from Daniel, Daniel Beatty, um, with the IoT notion and remote vehicle control, is the content model as practical? the knowledge transacted is likely to be small and frequent? So uh, Daniel, thanks for this question. And then that was actually um, one of, you basically have asked a sort of a research question that we try to answer in one of our paper. Uh, basically uh, you're right that there can be a content that can uh, be small, but needs to be delivered frequently. And uh, every time vehicles should not be sending out interest packet because it's gonna overwhelm the overall network. So that's where we have introduced some pushed um, notification sort of mechanism while keeping the legacy NDN architecture. So to answer your question, um, I mean, basically you're right that um, the naive NDN may not be practical. So you have to make changes, which we kind of proposed in one of the paper. Okay, uh, there is a more of a comment than a question from uh, Windsor, uh, who says he did not see the poll again. I believe Windsor is using Zoom over a, a web interface as opposed to using the Zoom app. And we've known that these are causing problems. Um, um, so uh, just be aware if, if you're participating uh, on this Zoom webinar or any other Zoom webinar uh, through a browser interface as opposed to a, uh, an actual Zoom app you may not get the full functionality, including not being able to see the polls. Um, that's the last question actually posted in the Q&A. Uh, 